Morning, all. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am Sri Lekha Pale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Com Community Engagement. One of our goals through Conversations That Count is to introduce you all to various sections of the Republican Party and the leadership within each of those sections so you can get engaged. This week, I'll introduce you to the leadership team of the high school Republicans. The High School Republican National Federation is a political organization that aims to unify and coordinate youth activities from across the country. These young leaders are working very hard to change the narrative about how high schoolers view the Republican Party and conservatism. Without further ado, let me introduce our panelists tonight. Uh, Sam Widner, he's a ninth congressional district chair for high school Republicans in Virginia and Northeast Regional Director for the High School Republican National Federation. We have young lady Reese Smith. She's the state chair of Virginia Teenage Republicans. We also have Luke Swetnam, who is the vice chair and upcoming state chair. All of you guys, welcome to Conversations That Count. It's amazing to have young leaders in the conservative circles like this. And I'm thankful that you took this opportunity to join our show. So let me start by asking Reese. Reese, you are the state chair, so I want to make sure, as always, I say ladies first. Let me start off by asking you a question. What exactly it means to be the high school Republican? Right. So to be a high school Republican, there's all kinds of definitions. You can be in the high school Republicans organization at your school. You can be involved in the party or you could just be a Republican in high school. And that's what it means to me. Um, I just know throughout the country, um, there's not everybody has a state organization or um, high school Republican chapters in their high schools. So um, if you're a Republican in your high school, that's the definition to me, so. That's good to know, Reese. So uh, Luke, let me ask you something because for those of us that don't know this and there will be a lot of high schoolers that will be listening to this show, are high school Republicans, is that a membership organization? Should students have to pay something to subscribe uh, to the membership or just subscribing to conservative values is enough to join the high school Republicans? How does that work? So, um, the high school Republicans is a membership organization. It is not a paid subscription. Um, you can uh, believe in conservative values. And I personally also think that it is the perfect place to find your um, place on the political spectrum. That's, that's, that's very good to know. So they, uh, but they do have to believe in the conservative value system or can they just come in and say, hey, I am not political at all. I don't subscribe to the value, but I just want to check you guys out. Because I, I think uh, uh, right now, high schools, I, I still consider them as young adults. They're definitely not uh, um, in their 20s or 30s to be in job market. So they may not really even understand what conservative value system is. How do they approach you, most of them? Well, um, the the people that are um, that are not um, subscribing to conservative values, I think they are just willing to learn, and it is the perfect place. Got it. So, uh, uh, have you encountered any time like a Democrat uh, where you uh, solidly felt that the high school student is a Democrat or a liberal or a progressive that comes in and say, hey, I want to join your organization. I, I'm to, I, I think that is an intriguing part to me because as a high schooler, you're still learning where you really belong until you have the strong family values that taught you. So uh, uh, can you clarify that in detail just a bit? Um, I personally have not had anybody come and say that they are a Democrat willing to join the organization, but um, I will say that I, uh, I struggled finding my place on the political spectrum. Um, so, and I eventually found my way to the Republican Party, so. Got it, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. So Sam, let me ask you a question. You are a ninth uh, congressional district chair. So does each district, because I live in 11th district, I used to live in 10th district, but uh, when I lived in different districts, I kind of never knew there is a high school chair. So does each district have a different representative or are you guys elected? Yeah, so 
as far as like the congressional districts, that is the ultimate goal is to have each district having a chairman. So for example, like you just said, I'm the ninth congressional district chairman. And you know, high school Republicans, we're a fairly new organization. The Virginia branch has been around for a couple of years now, and we really just kind of got the ball rolling recently within the next, well, the past year or so. But the National Federation, we just got going in this past May, early April, around that time. So we don't have every single district with a chairman yet or a chairwoman, but we're definitely trying to get to that goal. And I may stand corrected, but I don't believe Fairfax or the 11th district has a chairman or chairwoman yet. Got it. Okay. So what can we do as a Fairfax GOP or 11th Congressional? Sam, I'm also um, elected vice chair for 11th Congressional District. And one of our goal is to ensure that we have wonderful relationship with our college Republicans, high school Republicans, and so on. We want to build a foundation starting from all of you. So what can we do, you think, to kind of um, encourage high schoolers to represent us in 11th district. How did you actually get into it? So we might take you as a model and start focusing on recruiting some high schoolers. How, how does that work? Absolutely. So the biggest elections that everybody pays attention to is the presidential elections. That's actually how I got involved in politics is back in 2016 with that presidential election. But, you know, all of these other elections, such as municipal elections, even local state and house of delegate elections. Those elections are often overlooked and it's very important that we have high schoolers in, involved in those elections and in those campaigns and turning volunteering regardless of what it may be. So ultimately what each individual unit and even congressional district can do is support those high school students, get the word out there that the organization exists because I find oftentimes that people don't know that high school Republicans is a thing. So that's a lot of our issue and we're working on that as far as like promotion and things like that. But as far as what a unit can do, that is probably the biggest thing. Got it. Thank you. I'll probably take that back to our unit. We want to be able to support you as much as I can. I think in one of the podcasts, Sam, you mentioned that uh, it's very important that we don't consider you as leaders for tomorrow, but leaders of today, right? And I actually strongly believe before this conversation started, I mentioned I have two young kids myself, and I strongly believe regardless of political spectrum they are in, they should be engaged. And the least as um, congressional district representatives we can do is to support you all. So thanks for taking the time to kind of talk about it. So I'm going to ask, start with Reese, but I would love to ask all three of you the same question. I know as a, um, I, I have two kids, as I said, I'm a Fairfax County mom myself. Uh, so education is very important to me as an immigrant. I'm curious to know, how do you all balance education and politics? I know that um, if any high schoolers are listening, I want them to pay attention to the strategies that you all talk about. I know keeping up with GPA, sports, extracurricular activities, and politics right now can be challenging. So Reese, how do you balance it all out? Oh, um, so over the fall, I interned for the Yonkin campaign and I continued that internship um, from November to January with the transition team. And then I entered in the House of Delegates and it was a lot on my plate for sure. Um, however, I kind of had to find that balance because I thought at the beginning of the school year, I could do it all. And the truth was I couldn't, I was taking a lot of hard classes. I was the president of a club on student council and it was just a lot to balance. And then the swim team came a thing and I just, I, I, you know, you have to be direct and say, I can do this on the weekends and during some days during the week. So. Um, I think there's this misconception that politics will take up so much of your time and you'll have to sacrifice your grades and your extracurricular activities and sports teams when that's not the case. You just have to make time to do it. So ended up I was doing it um, in the fall around twice a week and then on the weekends um, only for like two or three hours after school. And that gave me enough time to do my homework and everything else I needed to do. Um, but you just have to find that balance and then also making sure that you're having time for yourself because it can be really stressful sometimes um, with everything. I know I got really stressed out for a while. Um, so I just had to also make sure I was taking some time for myself because that's really important too. So I would say time management is your best friend. 
with that. I think that is a f excellent strategy, Reese. And uh, I always say, folk, uh, when folks are not able to balance time, I say, no is a complete sentence. It's okay to say no. You don't have to say no, but I'll do this. But sometimes you just say no, and that's it, and then kind of move on. Uh, and as you said, I mean, politics is something, it is kind of sometimes seasonal. We want it to be yearly, but it can be seasonal, right? Once a midterm start, probably September is where it really peaks off. So as long as uh, you're able to balance that out, time management is a key, you're right? So Luke, I'll ask you the same thing. Um, I mean, Reese, again, going back to you, Reese, you just got into UVA. So obviously you were great at time management. You got into a great <laughs> school in Virginia. So Luke, let me ask you, how did you balance education and politics or how do you do it right now? I would say for sure time management. Uh, I know during the school year, um, it's, it's difficult. And I think the best strategy for that is when you're in your classes, don't focus on politics, focus on the teacher, focus on studying and focus on your, on your test. And um, make some time to study at home and I guess leave politics for the rest of it and then um I always try to prioritize things so uh prioritizing is also one of your best friends along with time management got it prioritization well, uh, no that is a key you're absolutely right Sam, I'll ask you the same question. I think this is where most kids struggle and I want them to kind of know from somebody that is doing it for a while. You have been in politics what, since you were 14, 15, if I kind of went back to your track record. Yeah, and you know, as Reese and Luke said, time management really plays a big role into that. And kind of going off of what Reese said again, limiting it down to a couple of days a week. For example, of course, you've mentioned my podcast sometimes. So I do my interviews strictly on Mondays and Thursdays, and then I plan political things on those Mondays and Thursdays as well, as much as I can anyways. So that is a real big help with me personally, but it also doesn't help that all of my extracurricular stuff is strictly political. So you can take that for what it is. I guess it's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's really the biggest thing is time management. Yeah, no, that's good to know. I think having those two dedicated days means that you can plan your days better and whatever may came, come in. I was recently uh, uh, reading a lot of college admissions, right? They did say that if you're kind of, instead of being a master of all or jack of all, it's, it's okay to kind of do what you're very passionate about and get into that field. I think for college admissions, um, they want to see that. They want to see somebody is trying to perfect one art versus trying to do it all. So uh, you focusing on politics is really not a bad idea, especially if you want to just do that for living in the future. So Reese, let me ask you something. I mean, do you coordinate as a state chapter president? Do you coordinate with local, state, and national levels? I know this is a fairly a newer organization, but what is the structure? Do you coordinate with them to advance the ideals of the Republican Party so you can shape the future leaders of America? How do you um, talk to younger, um, younger Republicans? Or I know that you will be moving on to college and somebody else is going to take on your role. So how do you do that mentorship role? Yeah, so um, the way that I do it is, um, of course, we have our congressional chairs and whatnot. Um, however, it normally just starts with um, you know, we have like different people around the state that kind of help us out like advisors I guess you would call them and they'll say hey like uh, I don't know, Roanoke County has a kid that's interested and is in ninth grade and wants to get involved can you talk to them I'm always like sure so I talk to multiple of our congressional chairs on the phone to get them set up and then give them and help get them the resources to set up their county like their local units and get in touch and contact with campaigns if that's what they're interested in if they're just want to be involved in the party give them the information for their party officials in their districts and as far as national goes um the state chairs in the national role um, most of the time we are um just there to um elect what we've done is we've elected our national chair and our national vice chair, our national board. And then we also kind of provide insight on what we are doing in our states to help them nationally to get um, the other states chartered. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many states we have chartered right now nationally. Um, Sam 
probably would know that better than I do. But um, we're also there just to help give them some insight since they're new, um, but also they help us out too if we need help. But um, yeah, I would just say like, just talking to kids and um, giving them the resources is kind of the biggest thing we can do from a state level and then help them get involved locally first is what I'm mostly here to do as state chair. So uh, Reese, as you're doing that, have you noticed that since Biden policies are failing so miserably right now, you're getting more of those calls from Roanoke and Fairfax and everyone else saying that they want to be part of it? Or you're like, nah, high schoolers probably are not paying attention still, so I'm not getting any more calls. Yes, sorry. Um, we have been getting a lot more um, membership requests lately, or not requests, but more people wanting to be members of the high school Republicans lately. Um, and I know I had like three signups in like two hours the other day online that came through my email. So that's something like I've, I've never seen before. Um, so it was really cool. But yeah, I've noticed um, since um, these policies have been taking a place and because at the end of the day, inflation is really, um, harming younger people too. Um, I know for me, I live in a rural county, so I have to drive a lot and gas is really expensive. Um, and my job, how much I make is that doesn't cover my gas money. Um, so I think that really has gained the attention of younger Americans or high schoolers. And they're now looking at this and being like, I wanna be involved so I, you know, that I can, save my money and hope to do and build a future that's better for me. So we have been seeing a lot of um, membership increase lately. And I think, uh, Reese, I told you in the beginning of the show that uh, I do a lot of community engagement, not only for minorities and immigrants, but just a community engagement in general. And I've seen more emails come through my desk uh, to say, hey, I want to be part of it. And I try to kind of um, get them engaged in asking why they are, uh, why now? And the first thing they talk about is inflation for sure. Yeah. So Reese, while we are on the same topic, let me ask you um, about college of uh, unaffordability or college affordability. Or, so do you, uh, kids kind of, as you're going to college, do you guys talk about it? And do, does that entice some of the high school Republicans to vote, wanting to vote Democrat because they feel like they're going to make this all free? I mean, what is that uh, discussion looks like? Yeah. So um, I know college is very expensive. Um, I mean, I'm UVA, it has a really high tuition rate, which I noticed when I was um, doing some of my financial stuff. But um, I think, you know, when we voted in 2020, um, a lot of kids who were my age um, voted for Joe Biden because they thought, well, um, you know, he's gonna make college more affordable. Well, now two years into his presidency, it, he hasn't done that. And that's just something I think Democrats run off of to get the votes of younger people. But I think our generation is kind of waking up and realizing that, you know, college is going to be expensive and the government can't pay for it all. I think they're waking up and realizing it's the same vote as healthcare too, where you can't, you really just can't pay for everybody's healthcare either. And I think they're waking up and starting to realize this and they're um, realizing that okay. um, you can't make college free, so. Yeah, absolutely. Medicare for all doesn't work. College education or college tuition paying by government doesn't work for all by any means. Um, no, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to kind of elaborate. Uh, Luke, along the same line, let me ask you uh, a question. Most high schools and college campuses are pretty liberal. I ran in 2018 and I went to Chantilly High School right here and Chantilly High School Republican Club. There were about six boys and two young girls that attended my meeting. And they said since uh, President Trump got elected, they, had, they, they didn't have... Uh, uh, they just were not courageous enough to even hold a meeting because they didn't want to be called racist, which was uh, very sad for me to hear because the kids were, I mean, they're just kids. I mean, they were 16, just trying to, 
embrace um, the conservative values. Um, so uh, it, it was just very heart wrenching for me to hear kids going through that kind of emotional turmoil just to hold a meeting in the fear of being called uh, racist. And I did go to ask them saying that, do you feel like, is this your fellow students or teachers or administrators? Who are you worried about? And they were just very skeptical about talking. So my question to you is, um, when you're running these high school clubs, do you get any visible support from your fellow students or administrators or teachers? Or um, uh, uh, what's the sentiment like uh, among uh, your peers? Well, um, thank you. Um, so I have definitely uh, been called a Nazi and a racist before, so I understand that. Um, I would say when it comes to teachers and administration, we, um, we get support for what we're trying to do. Um, of course, they try to stay nonpartisan uh, because that can um, end, get them ending up losing their jobs. So we don't want that, of course. But I think we definitely get support from them in our movement to get teenagers civically engaged and students for at least at my school, um, we definitely get some support. Uh, I've seen many, many, many people with Trump hats on and I mean they know that we're there. There's still some, um, some divide on whether they should join join a political organization or not because sometimes politics is boring and I even face that but yeah we definitely uh, get both ways of the of the divide okay so basically you just got it called names lame right which is uh, which is quite lame without any explanation <laughs> I wouldn't say that I've gotten called a racist and a Nazi from uh, high schoolers or administration more outside of that but yeah I've yeah got it okay but you know you're not <laughs> you're only right. trying to preserve your conservative values sam let me uh, let me talk about some con uh, content i'm very involved in my kids school myself i was um, my middle school pta president until my daughter is done with middle school uh, i know there's a lot of um, uh, focus on teaching content uh, sexualization of um, content and stuff so if you encounter that when you're um, doing your um, curriculum how do you counteract, uh, counteract that kind of teaching content in schools let's say if you don't agree with the crt curriculum do you talk to your teachers or you're like okay that's not something that i deal with as part of high school republicans or is that too much for high school republicans to take on yeah so this is definitely something that affects the whole state and of course a nationwide issue as well and we've seen executive orders that the governor put out on his first day in office against these divisive concepts being taught in school. But, you know, as you said, uh, sexualizing students, there are numerous bills that have went through the General Assembly. We've seen that when, uh, back in 2020, it was a model policies for transgender students. And it's exactly as it sounds. It lets boys and girls bathrooms, girls and boys bathrooms, so on and so on. And then, of course, we have all these liberals getting mad that critical race theory was banned, but it doesn't make any sense because why would you get mad about something that doesn't exist, especially if it's being banned? But ultimately in the classroom, I, I would tell high school students to not be afraid to speak up and to counteract their teacher on those ideologies. Because what CRT ultimately does is it teaches that there is a significant difference between races. It teaches kids to see color. And, you know, what a lot of us think is that we should be colorblind. We should treat people the same regardless of skin color, regardless of ethnicity, so on and so on. But CRT does the exact opposite. It teaches that there is a difference and that you need to be treated differently. Yeah, no, I, I am very thankful that you guys are just in schools kind of counteracting these things at a bare minimum, at least making any someone else aware that this is going on. You're absolutely right, Sam. Governor Youngkin has taken large steps and there are several bills that are in the legislature trying to fi fight this out. Uh, uh, but thank you for what you do as well. So uh, Reese, let me go to you. I see that many minorities, including women, they're disproportionately represented in high school Republicans and college campus politics. Uh, 
I think as um, uh, colorblind as I am, but I definitely notice when there are not many women in the boardroom, right? I definitely notice that when there are no minorities whatsoever in, a, let's say, Republican club. I think it's just coming from a different lens of being a minority, right? That just, it just kind of dawns on me that what I, I don't see a colored woman around here. Is that something you take a note of? If so, are you doing anything in specific as a chairperson to kind of bring more women or to more minorities into our tent? Yeah, so um, I know with Virginia's specific branch, we have um, women on our executive board and we have women as congressional chairs. So we in Virginia are pretty split. However, I've seen other states where they have no women or any minorities on their executive board. And you kind of look at college campuses and you see that with their um, college Republican chapters um, and even any political chapter in college campuses, it's typically male dominated. Um, working on campaigns, I've noticed that it's typically a male dominated sport. I, yeah, I actually wrote my college essay on this. I wrote about uh, just being a girl sometimes in politics can be hard. Um, but I think what I would say to younger women and minorities is, you know, we are going to be the person in the room that you know, we're not, we're the minor, minority in the room. And um, that's okay, because I, as a girl in politics, I've really, there's been a few times where I've like felt like I was shut out, but most of the time um, people are willing to hear your opinion and they don't they don't care if you're a girl, boy, what um, race you are, what ethnicity, they don't really care. Um, so I, I always tell girls that are afraid to get involved, like, you know, it's, it's okay. Like, it's okay to be a girl and to be in politics. Like, it's cool. Um, and people are always really respectful of it. And I've found that. Um, this party in a way, um, you know, hear, hear all the time about the Republican Party being um, this party of like bigots and white men, um, I guess, but I've found that um, everybody in this party is, I mean, I've, I mean, in Virginia, I think we have a really diverse um, leadership board and um, diverse party and they are some of the some of the most like welcoming people I've ever met in my life. So um, I would just say like, you know, it's not as bad as you think it is once you get involved and you will end up loving it. And absolutely, Riz, you are the bright example. You're the state chair that tells a lot about um, how open high school Republicans have been, how open Republicans have been. And also for our audience attention, I do want to bring it to your attention that we have several female minority candidates running right now, just in Virginia. I mean, look at 7th Congressional District. I mean, multiple people. And also, I think um, as much as uh, I feel that when I kind of enter it, I'm like, where are the other minorities? I also say it is um, also upon minorities to kind of get into and express their conservative values and be embedded. It's a two-way street. It's like we have to be colorblind. We just really have to belong to a tent and expand the tent because of the values we share, not at all because of the color. We all love America. If you love America, you just really need to be part of a conservative tent, which is very focused on strong defense, strong borders, America first policies, and so on and so forth, regardless of uh, what faith you belong to, what minority. And you are that example, shining example. I see multiple women coming up in politics, but you're right. I think uh, you do feel uncomfortable. <laughs> um, I think when I entered into politics, I did feel uncomfortable. I have a strong accent. I don't look like a typical politician or political operative, but I think once you kind of get into it, you, you're surprised to see how embracing, how loving and how welcoming this party has become my second home. So thank you for just leading all the brave women out there, Is <laughs> So Luke, let me, let me go to you. Um, let me go to an extent to say if today's young Republican leaders like you 
do not act, there is no assurance of a strong Republican party of the future. Like Reese said, uh, there is a perception out there that this is all white old men, even though it's still a perception, there is some truth to it. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on it? Is that something that resonates with you? Is that something that you use at a talking point with your fellow young, young Republican leaders to say, guys, if we do not act, there is no uh, assurance of a strong Republican party of the future. So let's do something. Is that something that you guys talk about? Um, yes, it is. And I, I, I completely agree, agree that it is very important to um, get the future of the American government and the Virginian government involved in politics because it is our generation that is going to care for the nation one day. They're going to be making decisions for uh, the nation or the Commonwealth one day. And it is very important that we act now, get involved as soon as we can to understand more of the system and not have one of those learning on the job situations. Um, so yeah. So you guys talk about that frequently. Yes. Oh, that's good because I think the more you talk about it, the more something will change, right? So thank you. Uh, Sam, um, I have been paying attention to the lot of activities of you all do. Occasionally, I try to con compare and contracts with high school Democrats also to kind of get an understanding of each structure. Tell me if I'm wrong. I realize that high school Republicans don't have much of a nationwide support system, no nationwide advocacy or no nationwide name recognition, and even funding for that matter. I, I noticed that we have about 16 functioning state federation. Reese did say that you probably know the number well, um, whereas um, uh, high school Democrats are everywhere, right? So, uh, I mean, obviously that can be the fault of you guys because you guys um, barely being what you guys are uh, with, the, with the college stress and stuff, you are doing your best. But what can we as GOP units do to change that? Even nationwide, statewide, what can we do to kind of make sure we support you all better? Yeah, so... As you mentioned before, the number of state federations, it is right there around 16, maybe 17 at this point. But we are working really hard to get that number up. And we don't have a significant amount of support on a federal level, but we are working with the RNC with their youth engagement director. We just appointed the YR national chair as our first ever national advisor, Rick Lowry. So that's really exciting. We're getting a lot of good progress. We just really come into existence, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, about early May, uh, early April, somewhere around that time. But we're getting a win rate account set up for donations. We're working out some tax codes, revenue codes, so on and so on. But ultimately, as far as a local party, as I mentioned, just having that support, promoting the organization, promoting the cause, recognizing that there is an issue in America and that we need to get as many high scores involved with conservative and Republican politics as possible. Yeah. With me personally, uh, being Northeast Regional Director, I've had the opportunity to work with the state chairs in Connecticut, uh, Vermont, West Virginia, and then we're working with Pennsylvania as well, and we have their full support as an organization. So hopefully some more recognition will be coming in on a federal level very soon. But yeah, as I said, as a local level, just that promotion and pushing the idea to get high scores involved is what we need the most. Sam, I think you articulated it very well. If GOP chairs are watching, I think one thing that I say is try to see what funds you can do as part of budget, right? I mean, allocate the budget to grow the party with youth engagement. I mean, I used to be the president of a local Hindu temple. The first thing that I uh, did was to have a line item that says youth engagement um, and then allocate like 10 grand, whatever we can allocate based on the donations that we receive. That way we know those funds should just go to youth engagement. It's a dedicated funds uh, because without funds, there is only so much you can do. Uh, and that's where everything kind of falls apart. You can only do so many free events, uh, but you just really have to have that kind of funds. Uh, um, hopefully I'll take the message out to multiple GOP chairs as my roles continue to expand. Um, Reese, let me ask you about um, what would it take to grow a chapter in each high school in the entire country as a state chair? You might uh, have a little more insight on it. And how do you make it fun and pal palatable to join high school Republicans? 
And I think my last question to that, and it's a loaded question, in high schools, is it stigma to call yourself a nationalist? Um, and uh, why is it that we have a hard time promoting patriotism in high schools? Uh, I know that's kind of a lot, just break it down, whatever you can. And I'm sure Luke will pick it up after that. Yeah, so um, with the first part, how long it would take and what we'd have to do, um, there'd be a lot of work to do. Um, because I think to start a Democrat chapter is a lot different than starting a Republican chapter because um, Democrat kids tend to be more accepted at school. Um, and um, I mean, it also depends on where you're from, but typically nobody has a problem with high school Democrats. High school Republicans could be a different story though. Um, just because um, Republicans are so ousted all the time. Um, and uh, for some reason, we're seen as these like terrible people. So I think that can be scary for kids our age, especially with college admissions and um, anything like, like trying to get into an honor society, maybe uh, grades, anything like that. Um, they think it can be reflective onto themselves. Um, if they were to join these organizations, which I would say is not true. Um, I wrote about, I, mean, I fully put on my college application, I was a Republican and I got into school. Um, so I think that it depends. So we had to get rid of the stigma first that all these Republicans are terrible people, especially with kids my age, because my age group tends to, or our age group tends to see it that way. So we had to first get rid of the stigma and then um, really get some of these older Republicans and I don't know if that sounds bad, but um, to get them to support young people and think, um, I think there's a stigma around young people too, where we haven't had enough life experience and um, to be involved or to formulate in an opinion, which in some cases that's true. Like when, you know, I've never worked like a real job, for instance, like I've always worked like a part-time job, but um, so I don't have experience in that, but I am more old enough to know, like um, have an opinion on inflation, for example. But um, so to get support from older Republicans at Sigma is what I think we really need to do. And as far as our generation goes with, I have a hard time saying that we're patriots or we love this country. Um, I think the majority of my generation does like living in America and, being able to vote, like they understand those common cores and they're very thankful and they get that we don't have those common things in other um, countries. Um, in other countries, like it's very unique to America to have freedom and whatever. Um, however, I think with our modern political culture that's normalized to say that you hate this country, which is really sad, um, but I think when they say it, they don't realize what the impact in which they're saying, if that makes any sense, they think, you know, it's okay to say that about a policy. Um, for example, this um, whole Roe versus Wade thing saying, oh, I hate this country because they overturned Roe versus Wade. And, you know, they're, I don't know if they realize they're saying they hate this country necessarily as much as they're just mad about a policy uptake. So I think it's just something that's been kind of normalized in our culture, which is really unfortunate because, you know, I don't think anybody should say that they hate our country, but um, I think it's so much just normalized in our culture today. Um, and I wish we could unnormalize it. And I think kids, you know, there's a stigma around saying you're a patriot too, where kids think it's, you know, like white nationalism or something, which isn't true. Um, so we have to get rid of for everything, we really just need to get rid of the stigma for all four of those questions. But I think all the things you said, Reese, I could probably talk to you for the next 45 minutes. You spoke so, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, you brought up so many points. I think you are already ousted by external parties. The last thing uh, Republicans within the party has to do is undermine your skills, uh, skill set and knowledge, right? Um, you already have to fight the battle outside of the home. So you shouldn't have to fight the battle for example, convincing me <laughs> that you're a good Republican or you know what you're talking, that should never be the case. And um, as you said about um, hate is a very, very strong word that has been uh, 
uh, normalized, which is extremely sad because, and uh, coming from, I, mean, I, I, I grew up in India up until I was 21 or 22. I mean, patriotism means a lot in every country. So it's a shame that our young generation or our people from, are kind of losing that patriotism. I mean, from coming from a different country, I value that country and I love America. So I, I so wish we built that right uh, from the get go from the childhood. Like I tell my kids, you don't know what you don't know and you don't understand how beautiful this country is. You only have to live elsewhere to appreciate and admire this country. <laughs> um, this is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, Go ahead. They just don't. I think in our yeah. I just don't think kids in our um, generation really understand how unique our values are to our country and how great we have it here compared to other countries. Um, so um, I think until they recognize that, which they're not, because kids kids tend to just look at one thing through one perspective, not multiple perspectives. Um, until they understand it, they're you know I'm going to keep on saying it, but I hope if I can do anything as a high school Republican, it's just to teach people that we live in the greatest country ever and um, hopefully to spread that mindset amongst my peers, so. Absolutely. Raisa, another thing I say is uh, when uh, kids are starting to argue with me about climate change, I say, first turn off your lights in the house. <laughs> turn off yeah. your lights when you get up. We'll start with that and then we'll move on about climate change. So, Luke, let me talk to you about, I know you're, going, you're kind of contesting to be next uh, state chair. What are the three priorities for high school Republicans? I know from outside uh, perspective, I think uh, Roe uh, Ro v. Wade or climate change or college and affordability, all these are big priorities, but you being a high schooler probably can elaborate. What are the three priorities for high school Republicans, especially from now up until November midterms? What do you think they're thinking? So um, I think with, with the midterms, we obviously have um, that uh, mindset that it might help us gain a majority in the House of Representatives and possibly even the Senate. Um, I think that we are focused on um, helping those candidates as much as possible and um, that we can do everything that we can for them, door knock, make phone calls. Of course, in the 9th Congressional District with Congressman Griffith, um, there's not much work to do. Um, just put up signs, make a couple phone calls here and there, but not as, not as intense as the Yunkin campaign. Um, but I would say just uh, drifting focus um, and making sure that we can win this majority. Excellent. So uh, focusing on elections is going to be your strategy for the next uh, three or four months. Uh, Correct. Got it. Uh, so, uh, Sam, uh, uh, let me not move on to a question without thanking you. I appreciate you for um, kind of able to facilitate this panel. When I reached out to you, you were gracious enough to recommend uh, Luke and uh, Reese. And uh, I can't thank you enough because I really uh, think uh, you guys are going to be our future leaders. It's important that we engage you all right from the get go and hear your point of views. So while saying that, Sam, as you know, conservatism is not a popular ideology. Reese eloquently spoke about it. So I guess my question is, how do you make it cool? I mean, in, uh, I'm sitting here thinking that how can small government and individual freedom not appeal to high schoolers or young generation? So what do you think is going on? You know, first and foremost, uh, thank you for having us on the panel. I think, I know I was especially really excited to come on and I'm sure the others were as well. But um, as far as making conservatism cool, we need to make campaigning and getting involved in politics fun. You know, there's this idea that politics is boring. People shouldn't get into it. I know that I get grief for being as involved as I am with it just within my school alone. But I truly enjoy doing things such as door knocking, uh, putting up yard signs, making phone calls. You know, those things that I enjoy. And when you're doing it with other people, especially other high schoolers, it tends to be even more fun. But we need to get over this ideology that the Democrat Party is spreading. And we need to confront that because it's pushing ultimately high scores away from the Republican Party. You know, there's I'm sure uh, we get this all the time minorities and women, there's the idea that they have to be Democrats, and there's something wrong with it if they are not Democrats. 
but we need to expose that idea and we need to bring to light that there are many minorities and many women who are Republicans. And I think that's kind of where it starts as far as bringing coolness, I guess you would say, to the Republican Party and to ideas of conservatism. Absolutely, Sam. Very, very well said, especially minorities and women. We just really need to take away that stigma that they have to be um, Democrats. And one thing that I say is uh, you don't want to give away vote all the time to one party because they start taking you for granted. And they have. They haven't done much for minorities. I can, as a minority, I can tell you that. Uh, they just took us for granted because they think we always vote, uh, vote, vote, vote for them. Um, so uh, while you're talking about females, so Reese, I'm sure you as a female leader, you encountered a question about Roe v. Wade. How do you navigate that, especially now? I mean, you are uh, a generation where you actually saw that happen under your watch. I mean, you, you're, you're part of that movement where um, you have to take questions about Roe v. Wade. So how do you uh, kind of encounter those questions? What's your typical response to them? Yeah, so as a woman, I, you know, at the end of the day, Roe versus Wade is impacting women. I mean, not really men. Um, but how I navigate that question it is Roe versus Wade is a very sensitive topic, obviously. Um, it's not something where most people are hot and cold on it, you know, one side versus the other side. It's a lot of, it's topic mostly where people are kind of all over the spectrum on it. Um, and how I navigate it when people ask me questions is I always say first, you know, you're allowed to have your opinion on Roe versus Wade, I have my opinion. Um, but I just kind of tell them my opinion and then they'll say something like, oh, well, that's because you're a Christian. It's like, no. Uh, <laughs> You know, I look at the policy and the science behind it, and this is, I believe this because this is what I believe. And I would say as um, a Republican, another thing like I would like to point out about this is you can be a Republican and not be like 100% pro-life. You can be supportive of, um, for example, a 15-week abortion ban, which I know the governor has said, um, about implanting, it's okay to um, have that opinion and mindset on it. Um, so, I mean, that's something I would say to my generation and women out there is um, you don't have to be all or against for it, um, but you should be able to make a decision back behind the science and policy behind it and um, kind of go from there. And also I know <laughs> you're not gonna change anybody's mind on abortion. So um, I think on the, issues side of it um, you know you're not going to be able to change anybody's mind so as far as getting people involved in the republican party um yeah of course we talk about that but we also talk about other issues like inflation and stuff that um affects more people i guess i i think you're absolutely right for with uh, i think by you saying that you don't have to be all or none uh, really helps high schoolers to kind of see, okay, where do I fall, right? Do I fall within 12 weeks spectrum, 15 weeks? But I think, Reese, one other thing that you might want to also emphasize is um, it, now the Supreme Court said that it is up to states, right? So yeah. uh, it is the state's responsibility, state's legislators. Um, to, so the burden is not uh, on uh, um, anybody else to explain. It's like you talk to your state, le state legislators. And also I think the accusation that you're a Christian, so you're going to be pro-life. I'm a Hindu, I'm a pro-life. So I yeah. think um, faith does play a role, but uh, I also say there are plenty of Christians, plenty of Hindus, plenty of Muslims that may not be pro-life. So it, it's just, I think, putting the blame on a faith and say, this is why you are what you are is also again, stigmatizing folks. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, Luke, let me ask you, you have what is called as American International Party. Is that a party or a project? I would just was kind of curious to know if you can talk to our viewers more about it. So it started out as a party, but it's uh, drifted more to a project since I became a part of the um, Teenage Republican Organization. And it really goes back to when I was first getting into politics. Um, I as I said previously, I had difficulties finding my place on the political spectrum, and it really gave me a place to learn, um, learn my personal views and 
then eventually go on to uh, to join the Republican Party. And it's it's a project. It's sitting on the sidelines waiting me waiting for me to do something with it. And honestly, I don't have anything on my mind to do it with it right now, but I would like to do something with it in the future. Absolutely. I think building first an organization itself is a challenge. Sustaining it is very hard. So you have a you have multiple things on your plate. So it's okay to kind of put it on hold for now until you have the strategic plan. But I, I think I was curious to know why did you name it as internationalist? Um, so um, the internationalist name kind of comes from sharing American ideas with other countries. Um, we... Uh, we love our American freedom, um, and uh, not a lot of people get to experience that outside of America. So our idea was to kind of bring that to other countries, um, kind of spread our American dream a little bit. Um, yeah. Got it. Thank you. Um, uh, Sam, let me ask you about Turning Point. I know Turning Point is something that resonates with most high schoolers and colleges. Um, have you attended any Turning Point event or do you think they mainly function college campuses? Recently, I was uh, hearing one of Charlie Kirk podcast and he said he's kind of trying to spread his message in high schools. Is that something that you've heard of? Yeah, so... Uh... This year, I just ended my position as the high school coordinator for the Commonwealth Territory, which is pretty much all of Virginia. And I left that position not because of Turning Point itself, but for other time obligations, such as high school Republicans, of course, where I'm now on the state and national board with that. But from what I've been seeing, they just formed like their own field program for high schools specifically. So that's really exciting to see. Uh, I do see that a lot of more college students are interested in Turning Point than high school students. And I think that simply just has to do because they're talking about things such as taxes. And of course, there's other topics that they talk about that seem to be more interesting to high school students. But you know, taxes, socialism, capitalism, communism, so on and so on, that comes kind of is their main points that they hit on. And so I think that a lot of high schoolers get turned away by that. And I think it goes back to making conservatism cool again, uh, bringing some coolness to those ideas. And for some reason, I find it fascinating to talk about capitalism and taxes and things like that. And I would definitely love to spread that around to other high school students as well, because it truly, once you get in a heated, heated argument or something like that, it's not as boring as what everybody seems to think that it truly is. Yeah. So Sam, instead of capitalism, you think using your words such as free market resonates with high schoolers? Because for, uh, I mean, I know capitalism has got a negative connotation right now, but if you say free market, that sounds appealing. I'm just trying to see how do we make, I think, um, I mean, I'm a middle-aged woman. I say, I don't think I am trying to make conservatism cool. I'm just trying to make sense to other people about conservative values. But do you think free market word resonates well to young leaders such as you and your colleagues? I think it does. Uh, the term alone sounds more appealing than capitalism itself because it's an idea that is so complex and hard to understand. But, you know, a lot of high schoolers, I don't think, understand how differently they would be living in if they were in a fully uh, socialistic or communist country. So I think bringing back those values and ideas and recognizing the idea that we're in a majority of a capitalist way of living or a free market way of living is very important. Absolutely. And also, Sam, I mean, I think one of the things that I'm very proud of the work that you do is you have a podcast called Rant World. I probably heard every episode that you did, believe it or not. I just really wanted to get into the mindset of high school or Republicans to see what do they talk and how what points resonate to them. So can you tell our viewers about your podcast? Yeah, absolutely. I love talking about the podcast. And, you know, it's something that kind of started out as a hobby and now it's becoming more realistic. I'm up to about 12,000 followers, give or take on social media and Facebook alone. So it's becoming more popular. We're on the top 200 charts worldwide for government. So that's really exciting. And, you know, talking to so many people from around the country and around the world is fascinating. Uh, learning those different viewpoints, everything from national security officials, and 
recently I was supposed to interview, we just had to reschedule, but uh, business owners, entrepreneurship, going back to that capitalism and things like that. So it's just really fascinating. And I'm really excited to see where it is in the next year, even next two years. No, I'm sure I'm sure it will kind of do um, do very well. Uh, I've heard of it. I think the content is extremely rich. The guests that you have really know what they're talking about. So it's just very interesting for those of you that have not heard. It's on Spotify too, right, uh, Sam? I think that's what I heard. It's called as Rant World. <laughs> Sounds perfect. And I've also seen Luke do a Facebook Live here and there just talking about uh, a Republican Party and President Trump and so on and so forth. It's just very, very nice to see. Reese, you also attended Sorensen Institute of Political Leadership. You interned at State Capitol um, under Governor Youngkins, as you said, uh, and also under Delegate Robinson. Um, that's quite a bit of political experience for your age. Any, um, I mean, we are in the last few minutes. I was wondering if you have any learning lessons from these experiences that you want to share with our audience. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, they're all so different from each other. Um, Sorensen, uh, Sam was actually in my class, funny enough, um, but the Sorensen Institute was mostly about policy and um, they are a bipartisan leadership training institute from the University of Virginia. Um, so there I learned a lot about policy and how it affects different people. Um, I was one of the only people in my group from um, like a rural area. So um, you know, me and Sam were definitely in the minority there. So we learned about different things that affect um, NOVA in different areas in Virginia. So that was all really interesting. So Sorensen's taught me a lot about policy um, in the state, but also how to work with other people that have different viewpoints than you, which I think is really important for our generation, um, especially in today's political climate. And with working on, uh, with Delegate Robinson and, uh, Governor Young in with their campaign teams and policy teams. Um, working on a campaign teaches you a lot of, I think, a lot of valuable lessons. Um, door knocking, talking to different people and hearing about how the issues affect them was really fascinating to me, but also taught me a lot about hard work and teamwork. Um, working on a campaign or in a political or in an office of some sort, you always have to work on a team to get the job done. Um, so it taught me a lot um, to not focus on, you know, your individual self, which a lot of like what schoolwork does teach you, but also just how to like work together to accomplish a goal. And then the hard work part of it was, I don't think I've really ever worked as hard as I did on those campaigns. I mean, I put my time into it and I put in so much effort, which I'm sure Luke and Sam would tell you the same thing. And it was a learning experience for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was my first time working outside of school and talking to different people. So um, it's a really good experience for kids our age and um, also um, just a really good life experience for anybody really. Absolutely, Reese. I think um, learning about politics is one thing, but learning about policy is a whole different ball game. I think uh, politics is a team sport. You got to rely and have confidence upon each other that they're going to work with you. So great job to you and Sam for attending and trying to understand what policy looks like. Luke, I'm going to give you the last word. I hear that you're going to be running as a state chair again. Do you, would you like to speak uh, anything about the position that you're trying to seek out for? Um, I definitely have a lot of plans, um, of course, going on uh, from uh, the unfinished business that we've had in the past trying to make the organization a place for it, a welcoming place. And I think we also need to take a note that we don't always have to be um, talking about politics in the organization. We can take a break, go play tennis at the local tennis courts or something. It doesn't always have to be politics. Um, so for uh, moving forward, I would definitely say that we need to get people engaged outside of politics within our organization as well. So I think that'll definitely keep people in the organization and get more people in the organization. So, Look, wise words, very, very well said. We can just sometimes chill out and talk to people like regular talks. We don't really always have to 
talk about politics. Sometimes I think that's what brings us closer and the other people will start realizing how normal we are, how much we are like that, right? And not always that political box. Guys, I can't thank you enough. We've had enough engagement on Facebook Live. I've had two beautiful comments. Diana Yebor, one of our viewers said, the young Republicans are brave, they think outside the box, are creative and are constantly coming up with the innovative ideas, the fresh blood for the nation, which is such a huge compliment for young leaders such as you. We have another viewer, Laura Hall, talking about, she disagrees that older Republicans have a feel of stigma. She, in fact, thinks our youth are going to be the driving force to lift this country. And I totally agree with Laura. I think with you, leaders such as you all, we have no doubt that you'll continue to uh, keep the courageous spirit after you even you enter into college. I can only see each of you running for congressional offices in the future or running campaigns, huge campaigns on the nation, uh, on the uh, national uh, spectrum too. And we will be more than proud to support you all. I'll take the message to GOP offices that we just really have to continue to support you, um, you all and uh, give the exposure that you deserve. Um, and continue to support you all. I thank you all three of you for coming on to podcast conversations that count. And I hope to see you again some other time when you get into college as college Republicans. So viewers, please share this video far and wide. Our young budding leaders, uh, uh, Luke Reese and uh, Sam needs our support. Uh, next week, we will have Harmela Arigavi. She's an Ethiopian American journalist. We will be talking and discussing quite a bit of geopolitics. Many Ethiopian Americans are quite frustrated with Biden administration policies towards the democratically elected Ethiopian government and its people. We will be having this geopolitical discussion on Friday, August 5th at 5.30 p.m. Hope you all tune in. Before I give, uh, before I tune out, I really, really want to emphasize that you please share the video, our young leaders, around the party needs to see this young wise men and women talking about politics. Thank you all for joining once again. God bless you all and God bless America.